So good afternoon. I'm Karen Nelson, co-director of the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies and director of research initiatives at the University of Maryland Department of English. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you as we celebrate the publication of Peter Grabowskis's book, A Sense of Tales Untold, Exploring the Edges of Tolkien's, liter or Tolkien's Literary Canvas from Kent State University Press 2021. Professor Grabowskis, a senior lecturer in the department, teaches a range of courses, including short-term courses on Tolkien, which um, the winter term in the UK, and on food in the summer term in Italy. His scholarship focuses on Tolkien, fantasy, and medievalism. Before coming to UMD, he taught in Italy and collaborated with the Roman Association of Tolkien Studies. Joining the conversation today is Chris, Chris, Christopher Crane, um, Professor Crane's research interests include the intersection of rhetoric and comedy, translation and identity, and Anglo-Saxon through 17th century English literature, Tolkien, young adult fantasy, and medievalism in pop, pop culture. He holds a PhD in English language and literature from the Catholic University of America, where he also received a certificate in rhetoric studies. As a senior lecturer in the department, Crane's courses draw upon these interests and areas of expertise. Please join me in welcoming our speakers, and I'm going to turn it over to them and get out of the way. So, yay! But I do want to um, congratulate everybody that's here, and thank you for coming. Thanks so much, Karen. Thanks everyone for coming. And I'm really honored to kind of facilitate showing off Peter as a, co a colleague and a good friend. I'm really, and really enjoyed your, the book, Peter. Here's a, what it looks like in case you don't have your own copy, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's an ex excellent book. And I'm uh, knowing Tolkien material well, I still learned, I learned a lot from it. And I was, I really admired the way Peter brought a lot of different things together. And I want to showcase him talking about it I'll just give a very short summary of sort of the basic premise of the book, um, which is that, you know, in Tolkien's work, most notably the Lord of the Rings, but really throughout his works, in addition to, you know, fantastical creatures and excellent plot lines and character development and all the things that we enjoy, <clears throat> there are often these references to other stories that the characters know in their past and, you know, ancient things that happened long ago that are meaningful to them. And though, and so this book is really an exploration of many of those other tales that some of which, you know, most of which Tolkien actually had in mind. He didn't just throw in random references. So uh, Peter has pulled together across not uh, the over of Tolkien's work, the uh, many of the posthumously published, you know, early drafts of his broader mythology, as well as an extensive look at things in, in the Lord of the Rings and all these little references here and there throughout the books. It's like so much more than I even realized was uh, in this, this uh, collection of, you know, hints and references and, and what those things mean and how they matter to the story. So um, Peter, I thought we, you know, we could I'll let you give a kind of summary of the book and, and introduce some of it first. Sure, yeah. And let me just say again, thanks, Chip, for being here. And thanks, Karen, for setting this up. Um, I had completely misunderstood the purpose of the book launch at first. I was halfway through preparing a, a sort of product demo to show you how this baby can get out even the toughest of stains. But, uh, but <laughs> Chip and Karen were kind enough to correct me. And so we're going to go with more of a uh, an edgy sort of Q&A. Um, uh, no, but as a kid, I mean, I'd fantasized about my first book launch and hearing those iconic words of you're muted uh, to, to, to set it off. But uh, no, this, this, is, this is fun. I, I thought I might uh, actually, to, to get us started, get you guys a head start on your homework, I guess, too. Just read a little snippet from the introduction, which hopefully uh, is passively successful in, in, uh, in explaining uh, what I'm up to and what, what it is about Tolkien that, that has so uh, consumed me for the last uh, few years. Um, okay, of the many charming treasures uh, unveiled in the recent Tolkien Maker of Middle Earth exhibition and catalog, the first Silmarillion map drawn by Tolkien in the 1920s on an unused page from an examination booklet from the University of Leeds is one that might be said to stand out. And how could it not? The experience of unfolding one of Tolkien's maps is a formative one in many readers' lives, perhaps even the first remembered instance of not just literary, but 
bibliophilic pleasure, the map unfolded on a bedroom rug or spread across a kitchen table. And of course, the maps of Middle Earth confirm some of our most cherished ideas about Tolkien, that he is first and foremost a world builder or sub-creator, as he puts it in his essay on fairy stories, probably the finest of the 20th century. But this map tells other stories too. Near the top left can be read the words, not in Tolkien's hand, but stamped with administrative authority. Do not write on this margin. Perhaps it is a story of wartime paper shortages and financial crunches of the conflicts between professional duties and private hobbies or of the idle fancies of bored academics. Whatever the case, it's a fascinating and even funny little window to a humble moment in the creation of a literary oeuvre that has gone on to shake the world. But neither of these are the subject of this book. This is a book instead all about the margins of Tolkien's work and what I call as an umbrella term, his untold tales, the frames, the edges, illusions, lacunae, the borders between story and unstory, and gaps and spaces between vast ages and minuscule periods in an ellipsis. Surely every reader of Tolkien's fantasies could rattle off a pet untold tale, whether it be the sure-footed cats of Queen Beruthiel, the wanderings of the blue wizards, or the bar menu at the Forsaken Inn my own for many years and I suppose ultimately the germ of this project was the narrator's grotesquely detailed hypothesis as to Shelob's recovery and return to action after her run-in with Sting. This ghastly digression is then as if our anonymous narrator's editor has finally stepped in, cut savagely short. This tale does not tell. Now in the case of the first Silmarillion map, Tolkien has not heeded the stern warning against violation of the marginal space at all. The contours of his map seem to spill over uninterrupted, unfazed by the warning in its bold typeface. He treats the boundary more as provocation than prohibition. And the sense of intrepid boundlessness of an excess of invention has also become indicative of popular views of Tolkien, both laudatory and critical. Admirers remind us that Tolkien did more than tell stories and make maps. He crafted trees of branching languages, genealogies, annals, writing systems, and verse traditions for imagined cultures. The illusions in The Lord of the Rings, notes Christopher Tolkien, the author's youngest son and literary executor, in the first of his 12-volume History of Middle-earth, a manuscript study of his father's life work, quote, are not illusory. The world he built has become like his classic description of the fairy and other world in non fairy stories. It is wide and deep and high and filled with many things. And his off sighted, overweening ambition outlined for potential publisher Milton Waldman to create his own body of legend linked to a majestic whole. Not so absurd, it would seem. As for critics, Tolkien has, ha has his fair share, inevitably perhaps, for one whose work has taken on such staggering popularity. The Lord of the Rings is by now a classic according to most standards, even the Twainians were, a book which people praise and don't read. I give just a few high profile samples for I think they touch on the tension between world building and the economy of writing that is central to this study. Harold Bloom's uh, introduction uh, to his volume on the Lord of the Rings calls the text inflated, overwritten, tendentious, and moralistic in the extreme. Nobody ever read Tolkien for the writing, adds Salman Rushdie in The Guardian, as if he had first stumbled upon his work in the pages of Playboy magazine. Edmund Wilson's infamous 1956 review of the Lord of the Rings follows up the legendary zinger of juvenile trash with an unfavorable comparison of Tolkien and James Branch Cabell. Cabell, Wilson boasts, can cover more ground in an episode that lasts only three pages than Tolkien is able to in one of his 20 page chapters. And he can create a more disquieting impression by a reference to something that is never described than Tolkien through his whole demonology. In this way, Wilson's review is not only hilarious, but actually anticipates by antithesis, the central 
argument of this book. I'll skip over some of the stuff, but um, on the title of the book, um, uh, which is glimpsed in the third epigraph here, is taken from an unpublished essay Tolkien wrote to accompany the last prose tale he published during his lifetime, Smith of Wooten Major. This fairy tale, which recounts a man's adventures in fairy and his final somewhat bitter surrendering of the magic star, which has been his passport to the perilous realm, invites a reading as a kind of swan song, Tolkien's last comment on the fantasy realms in which he traveled throughout his life. The essay likewise might be seen as a return to some of the theoretical precepts of fantasy writing first explored in on fairy stories. The passage runs thus. The beginning and end of a story is to it like the edges of the canvas or an added frame to a picture. It concentrates the attention on one small part of the country, but there are no real limits in the remote and faintly glimpsed distances. And in the unrevealed regions on either side, there are things that influence the very shape and color of the part that is pictured. Without them, it would be quite different, and they are really necessary to understanding what is seen. Tolkien takes a similarly pictorial view in reflecting on the success of the Lord of the Rings in a letter drafted in 1971. It, quote, emerged as a frameless picture surrounded by the glimmer of limitless extensions in time and space. And such a picture is consistent with Tolkien's long held belief in the importance of a story's impression of depth. Yet it is in the Smith essay that Tolkien finally qualifies the nature of this importance, suggesting as he does that the untold stories that ring all about the frame of a tale are more than artful window dressing. They are in fact really necessary to understanding the story proper. And so this book seeks to explore the edges of Tolkien's literary canvas and to inquire how these untold tales color, inform and enrich the reading of his work. And in the chapters that follow, I argue that untold tales are nothing short of a defining feature of his sub-creation. Um, I'll pause there, but um, the, the thing uh, unfolds in, in five stages. Um, uh, and, and the first tries to um, bring together a little bit of a, uh, uh, to bring together Tolkien's comments on, uh, on this impression of depth and on the conflict in his own writing, right, between uh, the game of world building and the, and the, and the, uh, and the needs of a, of a, of a story. Um, and in plumbing some of his uh, scholarly work uh, as a medievalist, particularly his commentary on Beowulf and his interest in the poet's technique there, and in the um, um, and in the curious sort of aesthetic effects of of these works that are um, that are to us now <laughs> that have gone dark. Many of the references and allusions there, whether because of damage to manuscripts or or, or, or whatever else, including the poet's technique itself, um, uh, we, we no longer have access to these stories that are that are hinted at. Uh, and then the, the heart of the book is uh, is is three three readings of of three kind of key texts. Um, the, the second chapter explores the Lord of the Rings, and um, but but from but focuses on on the last alliance on actually this sort of black hole of the second age of, of Middle Earth um, and the way that Tolkien um, uh, develops that and draws on that um, even as he uh, fails to sort of reveal it or explore it more fully, how that impacts uh, the story of the War of the Ring. Um, and the third chapter looks at a particular figure in, in the elder days, Turin Turambar, and what must be Tolkien's most told story of all and kind of revisits a, um, a, a debate in print between Christopher Tolkien and, and Tom Shippey um, about some of the difficulties of, of, um, of publishing and of reading, of, of enjoying uh, the Silmarillion material uh, after we've, we've, we've wet our appetites on the Lord of the Rings. Um, 
Uh, and the fourth kind of returns to Tolkien's uh, professional life um, in a perhaps a little red text called The Homecoming of Bergnoth um, and looks at the idea of a mission there. Um, uh, and, and the last chapter then looks to Tolkien's influence um, on, on fantasy and on sort of multimedia empires of today and how untold tales uh, uh, maybe play into some of that, um, our current obsessions with the uh, Game of Thrones and Amazon shows and, and video game uh, franchises and such. And that's the book in a nutshell. <laughs> A great, uh, great overview, and <clears throat> hopefully everybody uh, got a little taste of your what I find you're very engaging and and lucid prose. Uh, I've, I really enjoyed that aspect of the book as well as the ideas in it. So, and as you mentioned, Tolkien was well aware of the the this issue of these fringe tales, these untold tales, and it's been looked at and commented by others. How did you come to do a full a book length project? on this, you know, tell us a little bit about your process and where this started and how you got here. Yeah, um, hum humble beginnings. Uh, um, it, it um, well, I, I guess you could say it started sort of having a laugh about she love with friends in, in high school and sort of just luxuriating in some of those backwaters and strange, like broken hyperlinks uh, that we find in Tolkien's work. Uh, but but I guess I first got a little bit serious about it um, as an undergrad student at Maryland, uh, uh, stumbling my way into Berlin Flieger's course and and sheepishly asking if she'd help me uh, write a um, an undergrad thesis for the honors program, um, and uh, and it was Verlin um, who gets a lot of credit but probably deserves a little bit more, um, uh, who I think first pointed me to the sort of famous letter. Uh, that Tolkien wrote to, to Christopher, to his son in the mid 40s, right? Uh, sending drafts of, of the Lord of the Rings as a work in progress while Christopher was um, in South Africa doing some RAF training, right? Um, and uh, and where, where Tolkien sort of outlines this, this fundamental literary dilemma, right? The story must be told or there'll be no story, but it's the untold stories that are, that are most moving. Uh, um, so that, uh, that's, that's where it started and, and, um, <laughs> why gee, and you got to wonder, like it's 17 years between, uh, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, what was Tolkien up to? You know, I, I cranked this baby out in what, 10, 12, no problem. Um, no, but it's, it's been, uh, it's been a long time coming and, and you, know, this, this, the publication has been, yeah, it's it's a muted celebration, let's say, but uh, but it has been fun to to reminisce a, a little bit, reflect on some of the places and the people, right? Who who helped me uh, put it together? You know, really over quite a few years. So and uh, and you know to hit up distinguished alumni for for money too. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the some of these pieces, I realized that I would never ever finish a book if I, if I didn't uh, develop some kind of discipline or, or method. Uh, so I, uh, a few years back, decided to stop producing wholly unrelated conference papers and side projects and start to like uh, tackle this a little piece at a time. Um, so certainly, yeah, I mean, Chip, you, you've been witness to some of these pieces, you know, parts of the Turin chapter were scribbled uh, uh, on break from our uh, from our class uh, in Oxford in the winter term and um, you know sections uh, I, I can remember delivering a piece of this project on the last alliance um, to the PCA conference in Chicago quite a few years ago now too um, and some of the pieces uh, you know maybe didn't didn't seem like they belonged at first um, and that was maybe one of the surprising pleasure so of this long and kind of painful but neat process yeah great thank you yeah the one of the things you point out in the in the early part of the book is in in Tolkien's own letter you know he was concerned as he put it and, and you quote uh, to, to go there is to destroy the magic meaning if you know if you were actually going to tell all of these 
hinted at tales, it would make them less alluring. It's the, it's the fact that they're not told. Um, and that was a concern he had. And you talk about it as a fundamental literary dilemma, you know, and the romance of distance. I think that's a nice phrase you use. Um, and that is a major threat is exploring that with these uh, these tales. Can you talk a little more about why the why the magic is or isn't destroyed in some of these different tales? You know, how does that work? And uh, when, you know, or when does it kind of ruin it if you actually hear the whole tale or, or not? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And that, that line from Tolkien's letters, you know, comes in, the, this, uh, in this really frustrating period, I guess, in which Tolkien has finally found an audience. Uh, that wants the Silmarillion, right? After after all those years, um, but um, but he's finding it difficult, or you know, ultimately kind of impossible to to figure out how to present that uh, so that it's not sort of contradictory to the things that he's published um, in, in the interim, and 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 because he's he's kind of an old man with a lot of boxes of of mixed up manuscripts uh, to sort through. Um, uh, but again, and again, this this kind of comes up in a debate. I think in the in the late eighties between uh, um, Christopher Tolkien and Tom Shippey. But um, but uh, and I honestly think that that Shippey maybe concedes the point too quickly, right? That is, it, it's not as if Tolkien thought despaired of the the value of these stories of the elder days, right? What we call the Silmarillion material, uh, but but certainly finding a way to present them and, and finding a way perhaps to, to, to capture, recapture some of that lightning in a bottle that he had with the Lord of the Rings uh, was, was a conundrum. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when, when we have, when we do this program in Oxford and one of the, the sort of our starting point, our question is what we want to figure out, right, is how, how on earth did something like the Lord of the Rings come to be, right? And, uh, <laughs> housed as it is in the professional writing, it's it's quite funny to think about the sort of practical advice that you might receive from 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 reading Tolkien or think of Tolkien as a writer. Like, start you know by inventing a series of languages and then spend fifty years you know <laughs> developing mythology, <laughs> and you know finally maybe you'll produce a, a masterwork that that includes very little of that stuff, but uh, but that. You can glimpse it anyway, or or or, or feel its presence under the surface. Um, uh, but certainly, the third chapter of my book it does try to take on that question of destroying magic, I guess, most closely, right? And that we're looking at a, a character that a figure turned to Rambar, whom Tolkien wrote, it sort of haunted him. I think he wrote about him all the time, right? Um, I think he's he he shows up in and you know thousand line alliterative verse lines and, and he shows up in some of the annals and then the short prose summaries the kind of language uh uh that we expect of the Silmarillion is published in the 77 uh volume and in, and in longer prose right which which really was the story that Tolkien turned to after he completed the Lord of the Rings so um so that yeah, that was that was really the, the question or the tension that animated that third chapter, especially uh, whether we whether we can find some depths to st still in these stories and the kinds of pleasures that you get from the the intertextual relations between these these different versions and and the sense that um, that behind those um, say behind a, a short summary you know, that ends in Turin um, committing suicide, right? There, there's more there uh, for, the, for the reader to sort of participate in or, or ponder over, right? Um, uh, but, uh, but, but again, I, I think that, I honestly think that Tom Shippey was, was sort of more, more right than he lets on about that challenge. A lot of people have wondered, you know, why, uh, uh, why the Silmarillion is, um, such a difficult read, I guess, for some readers, or, or so disappointing to those who are coming from Lord of the Rings, and um, and you can talk about the the absence of hobbits and such, but uh, but I do think um, 
I do think that that sense of depth is captured really uniquely uh, uh, in, in Lord of the Rings. And that's not something that Tolkien could really replicate that easily. Great, thank you. Um, strikes me that, you know, some of, some of the aspects of these untold tales, these hints of older legends and things are adding to the fantasy, but then, and I think you point this out in the book, uh, Tolkien thought of them some, somewhat as just his sort of histor kind of historical realism. Uh, are those two opposed or how do those two things work together? Or what do you think is more one than the other in, in some of the examples and things? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, he he notes, I think, of Tom Bombadil at some point that, like, it's a, in a letter to a reader, you know, just as it, you know, in the real world, we don't really have an explanation for everything, right? Um, that that in some ways those missing pieces um, actually contribute to this sense of whatever verisimilitude or or the the believability, the historicity of this of this um, invented world, certainly. I mean, I, you know, Tolkien wanted us to, um, <laughs> you know, he, he describes this process of recovery, right? This, this benefit of fairy stories as a chance to clean our windows, right? Or clean, clean our glasses uh, and, uh, and see the world in, in stunning 4K, right? Um, so I think that... <laughs> I think that, that that that's part of it too, right? That a, a reminder that it's something that we need sometimes. Um, we feel like our uh, perhaps our science has has robbed us entirely of of mystery and and magic, right? And yet uh, and yet our world, uh, the people in it, and the and 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 the things in it too are uh, can be quite spectacular, uh, quite enchanting. Uh, uh, if you if you can take take a moment to to clean your windows, um, so yeah, I I do, and I will say that some of the in some of the parts of the book, I kind of I guess I'm I'm primarily concerned with Tolkien's technique, right, and, and his intention, right, but uh, but of course, with so much of his work sort of posthumously published, right, um, and in thinking too about some of his sources and his interest in you know the the difference, say, between a, a, a someone uh, listening into Beowulf in the Mead Hall, right, a thousand years ago, and someone um, fifteen hundred years ago, and someone uh, uh, reading it today, right? That 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 sense of distance that we have as as modern readers, right? That some of the sort of accidental um, uh, effects, uh, aesthetic and literary, that that these these damaged, crumbling, broken, moldy, burnt texts have on us. Um, so there's also a kind of, uh, I suppose, accidental irony or, or charm to uh, the messy state, say, uh, of Tolkien's mythology. Right, <laughs> that in a sense, um, the fact that it's not tied up with nice pink ribbons um, <laughs> adds, adds a sort of a greater sense of, of realism or truth to it in, that, in, in a way. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Well, you mentioned Beowulf and maybe not everybody knows that Beowulf was a big area of scholarship for Tolkien and a big influence. And if, you know, if we just told, you, told somebody that they might think, well, sure, heroism and Fighting monsters is a big part of that makes its way into the Lord of the Rings. But you spend some time on Be Beowulf's influence on Tolkien in this area of these untold tales. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on on that piece of your discussion? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that it's um, certainly for the subject of this project. But but uh, well, there's a lot that you could say, and and that has been said about Beowulf as. You know the the ten, you know uh, uh, Verlin would say that if you gotta read one book to understand Tolkien or the Lord of the Rings, it's gotta be Beowulf, right? Um, and I think that's that's true in, in large part. And, and in, in this case, it it really comes down to uh, yeah, Tolkien's sort of ear for keen interest in in the poets, right? That that technique, that sense of craftsmanship, right? He says of the he says of the poem and, and the famous lecture, The Monsters and the Critics, that 
Beowulf is more like masonry than music, right? Um, okay, and of course that's where he gives us this great image of the the tower, right? With the uh, sublime view of the sea that we don't get when we <laughs> when we um, obsess over sort of historically dating Helak or, or or trying to understand about some some obscure ritual practice, right? Um, uh, but but yeah, I think this comes through honestly most clearly. And people have been writing about Beowulf's influence on Tolkien for fifty years almost. But um, but I think it comes through maybe most clearly, and that's something that I was I had fun trying to do in the first chapter of the book, in the fairly recent publication, I think twenty fourteen, uh, of Tolkien's translation uh, and his commentary uh, on the poem, uh, which is really hundreds of pages of like uh, just glorious discussion of, of, yeah, that poetic technique and that, uh, Tolkien sort of fascination with the, that digressive method that, that the poet had and that, um, and, and uh, always a sense that, that there was artistry behind it, right? Uh, some, of course, some earlier scholars felt that Beowulf was confusing and messy, right? Because it was sort of like, a bunch of different pagan tales stapled together, right, by a, by a few monks in the scriptorium. But Tolkien really, uh, really had this vivid image of a, of a poet with a real plan, right, with a real artistic touch, okay. Um, and so I, I do think you can see a lot of, a lot of his thinking on the shape and the way that the poet makes use of allusions to feuds and 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 and, and dragon slayers and, and and the ancient history right much of which is is completely dark to us now um it was something that he was he was keen to sort of incorporate into his own vision right that um that image uh, uh, from the introduction, right, of the, the frameless picture, right, and the, the extensions on each side, right. It, it, he, he described Beowulf in, in similar terms. Um, I want to say it was like a, like a play scene in a room, and from those windows you could see this, you know, vast stretch of time, right, you see the sort of dark ages uh, stretching out from those from the from the immediate scene, right? Um, so yeah, I think that um, I think that that of course Tolkien was interested in the fantasy elements there, right? Um, and and the sympathetic view in that strange kind of uh, pairing or blending, right, of the of the pagan and Christian worldviews, right? Sure, you could, of course. Um, but in the case of Untold Tales, right, I think it was mostly about the sense of craft um, and the way that um, the sort of elusive style uh, uh, that the poet adopts and what kind of a th aesthetic effect that has on us. Yeah, that's so true. That's a good way to a good way to put it. Um, toward the toward the beginning of one of your main chapters, chapter two, where you really dig into the references to the Last Alliance War you know, throughout the Lord of the Rings, you say, um, about the Lord of the Rings, you say, uh, we might say that it is not so much a story about war as it is about war stories, telling them, reading them, remembering and reflecting on them. Of course, now war is in the forefront of world events once again for us too. Uh, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about that, what, what you mean by that, unpack that a little bit for, for everyone. Yeah, great. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, so much of I think it's 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 hard today to come at Tolkien fresh, right? Um, because if I mean, you know, whatever. Growing up in the whatever in the early '90s, I was I was consuming Tolkien knockoffs and and, and video games and things before before uh, I developed this you know dependency on on the professor himself, but. Um, but you know, you 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 have these impressions that you get from the way that modern fantasy is codified for us today, with a sort of uh, heroic clash of good and evil, and, and all this sense of action, right? And we have a taste of that, of course, in Lord of the Rings. Um, but you wouldn't say that that's really 
Um, <laughs> that's really what it's about, right? And, and on a reread, I think you'll notice that, you know, our camera moves away from most of the cataclysmic clashes, right? And instead we, we, we return, uh, we have these stories told to us later, right? Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously this is a major feature, I guess, of, of, of much of the Tolkien story craft is he's not just interested in the plot, but in, and perhaps this has to do also with the, the, the medieval background, but how, how did the story become transmitted, right? How has it moved? How has it gotten to us, right? Uh, but so we have so many characters within the text, right, who act as storytellers and, and listeners, right? Uh, Bilbo, you know, has some facility with, with the Elvish languages and acts as translator, right? Um, and we have this whole sort of textual history, right, uh, that plays out within the, within the, within the fiction. Um, and so the, the last alliance, you know, seemed to me that the the big one uh, in the Lord of the Rings, right, and and uh, again unusual too because if we think of a, a popular view of Tolkien as having like what separates Tolkien from from you know his imitators, right, is that, is that he he really he wasn't bluffing at all, right? This was all this was all <laughs> this is all laid out, you know. <laughs> in binders with, with timelines and stuff. I mean, that's true to a, to a point, but, but it's interesting that, that, that the Lord of the Rings is set, not, it doesn't butt up against the, the legends that are sort of codified in the first age, right? In the Silmarillion material, but instead against this big dark age, right? That is the second age of Middle Earth, right? Um, and that was, what what history, what stories we have from that period are sort of developing more or less at the same time as the narrative of the Lord of the Rings. And, uh, and of course, in the case of the Last Alliance, which is sort of my key example in that second chapter, um, we get enough to go on, right, to get an idea, but it, it's, never a, it's never a tale uh, told, I think, in any sort of straight or satisfactory way, right? And we see that that has real implications again for the immediate action, right? For our characters. I mean, I guess most notably um, uh, Gollum um, in the chapter. I kind of look at him as a as a focal point for <laughs> as a, an odd sort of lore master, right? Uh, who who keeps these stories that we don't quite understand alive, right? Based on the oral traditions that he grew up with, and on all his sort of years of snooping, and and of course being quite quite obsessed with the ring and with Sauron even uh, humorously as his, his chief rival, right? Um, so I, I kind of read, it's, I read uh, the, the, the climax there in Mount Doom as a sort of reenactment, I guess, uh, perhaps inspired a little bit by, by Gollum's, um, by Gollum's personal canon, right? His, his vision of, of this, uh, of this battle, you know, 3000 years prior and the last alliance and how that sort of shaped the geopolitics of the third age, even though we don't really get to see it on screen at all. Yeah, great, great um, the discussion of that. Um, well, and, and in terms of, you know, influence before Tolkien and and, and throughout and, and then after, uh, as you mentioned in your opening summary, your final chapter looks at literary and pop culture descendants of Tolkien, things influenced by him, film adaptations, you look at video games and the fantasy genre in general. And of course, um, as with Beowulf, uh, it's easy to see, you know, magic, elves, monster battles and the like are more, more popular thanks to Tolkien's influence. But um, how have you, how have the untold tales of Tolkien, that, that, that element of his stories influenced these other writers and other forms of storytelling in pop culture now? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think um, uh, 
I mean, I mean, I feel like this 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 tension is maybe felt more strongly than ever as world building has become like the the dominant mode, right? And the way to uh, sustain a successful franchise, right? You know, the the need for the sort of insatiable need for content, right? Certainly pressures the storyteller, right? To uh, who you know, maybe had a, a charming little digression or a, a mysterious figure on the on the periphery, right? A, a Bubba Fett, if you will, right? Who, well, <laughs> he's going to need his own series, right? And not just a series, but a series of bobbleheads and lunchboxes and things like that, right? Um, merchandising, um, and of course, uh, you know that's 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 where we're going with um with the amazon uh show too so i mean i'll say that um when the early rumors about that show were for a, a this is going to be the 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 aragorn the, the strider prequel right it'll be about his period of of Aaron tree right um uh, you know that too of course is is one of those great things that's that's hinted at in Tolkien's text, but not explored in any in any depth. Um, but I think it was, I thought it was a good decision <laughs> to to set things in the second age and to um, and to you know basically create some fan fiction in this this playground, right? In which Tolkien has sketched out a few really important set pieces, right? Um, but that really is kind of open, right? Not, not a, not a cherished um, a site, I guess, for the for the toxic fandom, right? Um, uh, you, you won't hear me griping as much about how they ruined Denethor or Faramir, right? Um, uh, we, you know, we, we don't we don't care about <laughs> the 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 kings of Numenor <laughs> quite so much, right? Um, so, so yeah, I think that I, I think that it, it is, it is certainly a, a concern today. I think, you know, I, I talk a little bit, I wish I were better read in these, in these things too, but I, I talked a little bit in the fifth chapter about like my experience of reading George Martin's ongoing <laughs> Song of Ice and Fire, right? And how that seems to be, seems to catch that bug of like world building for world building sake and but it seems to like lose the thread <laughs> if there ever was one right of like where where is this story going right um, um yeah mm. so i think that tension is very much alive mm. and of course uh of course we could say that the hobbit films maybe show us some of the worst <laughs> uh, the most dire kind of you know these this slight and slender and charming, you know, prelude to the Lord of the Rings, you know, is is pumped full of, um, you know, Purdue chicken and uh, into a three volume <laughs> beast, right? But 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 all those great little allusions to, yeah, what was the White Council up to? And wow, what's Dol Guldur like, right? Um, <laughs> if we find it, it's New Zealand. <laughs> it's the Weeda Workshop again. Um, you know, I, I, I do, <laughs> but for me anyway, personally, that, that was a, that, that was a nice indicator uh, that um, to go there is in fact to destroy the magic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, yeah, I, 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 um, I can kind of enjoy the Hobbit movies if I forget they're based on a book that I really like. Uh, <laughs> um, they're kind of entertaining in their own right in some ways. Well, Kelly has a, a good question here. Back to Beowulf a little bit. I love your interest in Tolkien's untold stories as central to his world building. She says, my students are convinced that Beowulf is all digression, even as we try to show them the thematic connections. To what extent does Tolkien use them in the same way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, maybe a good, maybe a nice case study would be in, um, I mean, I guess, thinking about the most glaring say digressions and in, in the lord of the rings i mean one of them so glaring right it had to be cut from the films right tom, tom bombadil in the old forest right that that figure who and of course if we if we 
if, what we now know about right the, the history of that figure right that that in fact he was a kind of <laughs> you know he was a, a figure uh, who was part of some poetry that Tolkien had written was based on a toy that his children had uh, you know like Tom Bombadil really didn't belong right he really wasn't part of a a sort of vision that Tolkien had um, from the outset, right? And yet, um, that excursion, right, uh, in in the old forest, that 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 opportunity to meet with this this figure, right, who who doesn't fit, and who does these strange tricks with the ring, right? I mean, <laughs> I think it adds tremendously to to giving us that sense of yes, what the ring is and what its powers are and what its limitations are, and how our sort of uh, our, our, our characters are going to struggle with that because they're not going to function in the way that Bombadil does. Um, uh, um, but, but yeah, cer I mean, certainly I think what happens in the Lord of the Rings is that um, those, <laughs> I mean, I suppose you could treat even the whole the whole heroic thread um, that is, you know, almost half of the text as a kind of digression, as a sort of like um, in the background, right? There's this great war um, and this great sort of uh, political play of wizards and stewards and, and exiled kings, right? But the heart of the story remains, right? This sort of very personal quest that's on the ground um, in the hobbits and in this 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 impossible um, journey um, to get rid of the <laughs> the artifact, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Scott asked a question. Um, was there any apprehension on your part about writing about stories of Tolkien's that are unfamiliar, even to the well-read Tolkien fan? How much of your decision to integrate a discussion of the Last Alliance was an effort to facilitate a long-running connection with an already existing audience? Good question. Yeah, well, that's a great question, Scott. Um, yeah, my audience to, I guess, to, to write an academic book about Tolkien is still kind of a, <laughs> will raise some eyebrows in general, right? But. Um, but yeah, I am I am curious as as the book slowly makes its way out into the world. Like um, I'm I'm not entirely sure who this is for, Scott. I'd like to earn the the adulation of my you know fifteen Tolkienists or maybe just their scorn. I don't know, but 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 maybe better still would be yeah the the reader, <laughs> the real reader, the the real person uh, who who's perhaps interested in Tolkien or, 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 or read Tolkien 30 years ago and would like to have another look. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, that second chapter, I suppose, is the most accessible in that sense, right? And that, that and it's hard to believe that anyone would be reading it who hadn't read The Lord of the Rings. So, but some of the other stuff certainly wanders off more into the the curious again by waters so um turin maybe will be familiar at least to readers of the silmarillion but much of the discussion really is is about those variants that that show up in the history of middle earth and such and the homecoming let's face it has to be the least <laughs> the least read text um, by tolkien ever <laughs> But it's amazing, and uh, and if if the book succeeds in any way, I I I I, I hope that that it'll send people back to the text or send people to a place that they haven't been before. Uh, um, uh, it um, I don't know I it, it luxuriates in in some of my favorite um, obscurities, uh, and uh, I don't know. I hope it'll do something for you. <laughs> Great. Justin commented that you're uh, you're rising in the ranks there on Amazon. It's great. <laughs> yes, um, yes. My revival yeah. tent is coming in 2023. <laughs> yeah. um, other question, Q&A, uh, more other questions. You can unmute if you want to just talk or in the chat from anyone. Yeah, please. Um, any questions so far. Yeah, if you're really out there, I'd love to, to see you or hear, hear from you. Um, 
Oh yeah, how you were going to mention how people could buy the book. Yeah, yeah. If you if you're interested, if you haven't picked up your copy, you know, uh, uh, I, I write me an email and uh, I've got some some copies available at discount. I'd be happy to to inscribe for you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you so much. So far, everything's been really interesting. And um, Chip, you asked a lot of questions I kind of had myself. But one thing I've been thinking about, Peter, is um, this quality you describe in Tolkien's writing. And I haven't finished the book. I'm partway through it, and it's awesome. But um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if we see this in other um, other examples of literary genres or other writers who do something similar in a very different way, right? Like my first thought, and it's been a while since I've been in English classes, but my first thought was something like Shakespeare where, uh, you know, because of the uh, nature of the drama, a lot of the really interesting stuff happens off stage, right? And um, to me, that is something I love about Shakespeare and I love that about Tolkien as well. And I wonder if um, you've had any time to think about other writers that do this and in, in a way that enhances their literary um, appeal. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, I wondered if, um, oh, I mean, for some, for whatever reason, I suppose world building is often associated primarily with you know, fantasy or science fiction or something. And yet, in a certain sense, right, any, any writer is a world builder, right? Um, even if that world is New York in the 1950s, right? I, I suppose we expect more, <laughs> there's more effort and more work needs to go into it to, to articulate a, a, a fantastic place, right? Because we don't have that sort of shared New York in the 50s, we're all, okay, we can get there. You don't need to, you don't need to do as much, as much work. Um, but um, yeah, it's a great point about, about Shakespeare and, and sort of, I guess, just the, the dramatic form, right? Um, what's that? Um, pursued by bears and all that, right? Um, uh, I guess in, in the book, and maybe I haven't gotten that far back, oh, geez. But, uh, but I, I, one, one writer that I do consider is actually Hemingway, um, um, uh, less so in, in interest in his, in his stories themselves, but about the way he articulates his iceberg theory in the way that I think that can be a really useful way to think about some of that um, intertextual stuff that happens in, in Tolkien, right? Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, and certainly I guess the, the, the shock value of Hemingway is, is nice and that you, on the surface of things, of course, you couldn't think of a two writers more <laughs> distant and goals or politics or skills as big game hunters and things like that. <laughs> yeah, Emily uh, shares in the chat, There's the, we do have a copy in the library. At, at, uh, oh, our... but only one of you can check it out at a yeah. time. So please, Great. you know, right. Yeah. <laughs> Great, other, other questions? While people are thinking or typing, I'll, I'll ask you, um, do you have a favorite untold tale of the of the many different snippets and and bits and pieces after kind of steeping yourselves in the in silk in these and thinking deeply about them? Do you have a favorite? Oh, gee, yeah, I don't know if I could pick just one. I mean, um, it's silly, but I always liked um, I always liked in the approach to Moria, right when we when we found out, when we saw that Strider was so opposed, right, to, <laughs> to going underground, right, and it sort of slips out that, you know, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've passed through there once before, but, uh, but I really don't want to relive that experience, right, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and that, actually, that's one that, that, that has a funny sort of history, I think, that, that gets caught up in how Strider uh, was once a, a hobbit with wooden shoes, right? That how <laughs> Tolkien was had no idea who Strider was for such a long time. That um, that there was kind of a a story about his his capture, his experience in in Moria. That that of course um, disappears when Strider becomes a, the the heir of Isildur in, in exile, and yet that little that little. Um, provocation there remains right and 
contributes to our sense of the menace of Moria, right? And, and the mystery of Strider. Um, mm. Um, yeah. But like I said, I, I don't know if I could. I, I, I hate to pick just one. Uh, oh. Yeah, uh, that's a good. That's a good. Good example. Yeah, it makes me. I was just rereading that part the other day, and I. I was wondering. Oh, that's right. He did that. I remember reading The Hobbit as as a kid in 1977, right after the cartoon came out, and I found out there was a book. And in the book, it mentions when Bilbo first gets his little dagger that's like a sword you know Gandalf says well that was made in Gondolin for the Goblin Wars right and this is in The Hobbit where Tolkien wasn't even trying to connect it much and I remember thinking oh wow what's that you know and um it was just a few years ago but finally the the, the the Fall of Gondolin volume came out although you could read parts of it in other things and uh I wonder how much of that influence you talk about this in in the book too to you know George Lucas uh in Star Wars and I remember you know first time you read when you the first first you know the 1977 same year episode uh right. four and he says that was from, well that happened in the clone wars you know yeah. and, uh yeah. wow what is that it's a very similar effect mm -hmm. um uh, karen um asks would you want to talk about the relationship between our course uh the tolkien studies course that we do abroad and this volume and some of the things you know you do in we do in that class yeah um Great. Well, yeah. Um, well, you know, the, 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 the process of writing the book and the subject, right, this, this, this sort of iceberg, I guess, of Tolkien's uh, uh, work have gotten me thinking about the writing process and, ha and do have me thinking of uh, like how to, how to teach that, you know, a lot of the writing the students in the writing courses are, are, at times reluctant to uh to start over or scrap something right or omit something right um and so that that's been fun to think about like um how that kind of the work that goes into it right um it's so much right the the, the so much is submerged right and that so much of writing is not like um not the physical capability to clack out you know five pages double spaced but the, all the thinking and all the drafting and all the and all the pain and suffering and reading that goes in underneath it that really informs it that gives it substance right hmm. uh, um uh and uh and some of the research that i was able to do in the archives at the bodleian library were uh you know connected to our our, our travel course in the winter hmm. Uh, looking at the uh, the homecoming manuscripts, especially, um, That's right. um, yeah. So, if anybody still needs professional writing credits, <laughs> right. um, uh, it's a good well, we are offering a, um, the online version of that later in the summer. If you have any students or no students, and then yeah. hoping to revive it uh, with study abroad in next winter. So, yes, yes, it's been too long. <laughs> So I should add, oh, go ahead, sorry. Justin. Yeah, I wanted to add on to that because I actually helped um, Chip and Peter with the course this past spring. I think that 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 idea of untold stories is also something that students really latch on to, and they don't entirely realize that they're latching on to mm -hmm. it. So I found in a lot of the commentaries providing on people's drafts, I was like, there's a story here, right? Like, and I, I would start paraphrasing Peter um, to some extent in my comments, talking about like untold stories and histories that are in the background. Um, and as someone who theoretically when I can writes fiction um it's something that I, I think about a lot too is is sort of omission as as presence right so when you we're talking about authors work in the same vein I actually thought of Kafka and I was thinking about like if in the penal colony was written now we'd get 45 pages about how the torture device was built right which <laughs> isn't the point of the story right at all yeah. but like yeah. I, I think helping students especially in in a literary world where world bell world building meticulous detail has become as Peter said, like a, an end in itself, like the virtue of omission um, and, and, and the value of that, I think is something that students really attach onto, even if they don't wholly realize it. Yeah, hmm. yeah. That's a good point. Nice. Great. Well, we're, we're at one o'clock. Peter, do you have any closing thoughts or Karen? Thanks for stopping by guys. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, um,